All right, everyone. This is Damon Postolka with the Exit Your Way Roundtable. Thanks for stopping back again. Today with me, I have Matt Crump. Welcome, Matt. I am so glad to be here, Damon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you, Matt. It's been, uh, been a long time coming for you and I to get on video together and talk about some stuff. Well, first of all, Matt and yeah. I we normally go on about 3.05. Matt's been having a little bit of internet trouble. He's working off his phone. If we have trouble, just want to let everybody know that we're going to we're gonna reschedule if we have to, but hopefully we can get through it, get through some good stuff because I'm sure that we got enough for two times if it if uh, if we have a little a little down today. So yes, Matt, awesome to get to talk to you a little bit. You know we have uh, you you've got a heck of a story. You've got a heck of a story, and I don't know how many people know it. And I'd I'd you know when you when you go back. Uh, back to the to the beginning, what you can see on LinkedIn, um, you were in the military. Yeah, and, yep, I was. I served uh, in the United States Army. Yeah, uh, back back about a hundred years ago. Yeah, <laughs> we were. I was. Uh, I joined the Army in 1986, and um, by uh, my second enlistment, I was in the Berlin Brigade. Yeah. So it was a, a really awesome elite opportunity to go to a place like that and to be a part of some history that was I'm a history buff. So to be a part of something that that massive was important to me. And little did I know that by the time I got there, within a couple of months, the Berlin Wall was coming down. Well, that's 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 why I brought it up. I saw that and I read about it more in the time you were there. That's it had to be an incredible experience. It was amazing. It was a really awesome time. There were so many things going on at that particular time. Uh, I have so many different perspectives. One thing that really stands out is that Pink Floyd came to do a concert there, The Wall. <laughs> and you would think that they would have been packed out, right? Like, I thought there was going to be, uh, like, just elbow to elbow people. Yeah. But it, it turned out to not be such a big deal. Not that many people showed up. It was crazy. I still remember Pink Floyd, Mile High Stadium, Denver. It was like in 2000. I went there. I was on the 50-yard line. Wow. It was freaking incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, it was absolutely incredible. They're, amazing. they're still amazing. When they played Money and the music went around in that stadium, I thought my head was going to explode. It was incredible. <laughs> it was just nothing like it. Nothing That's like amazing. it. That's amazing. And you don't even have to be high to think it sounds that good. No, no, no. It, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, I'll go yeah. off on that in a long time. But it, yeah, it's it, it is something. That's for sure. Very cool. Yeah, it was it was a fantastic time. I, I was very very blessed to be able to be a part of that history. This yeah, before. not yeah, that's cool. but the whole thing in, in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really cool. All right, all right. Well, being in there in that time that time in your life had to be interesting, especially. I'm I'm, I'm sure you weren't a you were a young man at that point, and there were a lot of things to do. So that's cool. Yeah, I joined the army when I was five. So yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> like most of us, like most of us. That's right. That's right. Good, good. Well, you know the 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 interesting thing, and I don't know if people really understand is is you you've got a history of being a business owner. I mean, you've had a couple different businesses and in them, out of them, and sold them, all this kind of stuff, and. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. That's a yeah. I've always been a a, a business guy and at heart. When I went to uh, high school, I left in tenth grade to go to a vocational school, where I started marketing, sales, and services. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a great two years of my life. And our senior project, we had to create a business plan and create our own business. Yeah. Um, so I had I had it all mapped out and planned out by the time I was seventeen years old, which was pretty amazing. I, I made some pretty pretty bad decisions of my life, and I I, uh, I detoured a lot of those plans from happening uh, right away. But I eventually got back around to it. So um, yeah, I've had uh, several businesses, and uh, it's been quite interesting for for me to be able to apply some of my my gifts, talents, and abilities into those things. As I'm a singer and a songwriter and graphic designer, and um, you know, like I said, a musician of, the, of sorts as well. So. You know, I've been able to do different yeah. things. Plus, I'm into cars. I've been into cars for a long time. So one of my first businesses was in the automotive world and yeah. had a, a 
a detail shop and a, and a fast lube and things that it was really just a blast to be able to have. Yeah. So, so let's, let's just get right to the point. Okay. Two things. Are you a, a GM Ford or Mopar guy? I am. I'm definitely not. I guess I'm more Chevy than Ford because my, my biggest build was a 69 Camaro super sport. That's my dream car. And I, I built one, loved it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've had a few Fords, but they all fall apart. So I, I didn't keep the Fords. Yeah. But I did keep my Chevys. Uh, my, my greatest gift that I have right now sitting downstairs in the garage is my 1938 Studebaker state commander. Ooh. Yeah. That's a nice one. It's, it's, it's a nice one. It's a nice, it's all done. It's, it's an, it's a beautiful car. I wanted a Studebaker just because um, I really love the low well, I'm, I'm a history guy. Right. So Studebaker was really around before Ford was. Yes. And Studebaker was, was the luxury stuff going on. And I mean, they were into the carriages and whatnot before they made automobiles and they were into luxury carriages. And then when they did cars, cars and automobiles, they were doing some great vehicles, but they're way more expensive than what a Ford had at that point. Yeah. And uh, the only thing that Ford did better than uh, than Studebaker was the assembly line, of course. But Studebaker actually already had something that Ford did not have. And that was dealerships. Yeah. Studebaker had dealerships all over the place because they were already selling carriages. So they had no problem bringing cars into that kind of scenario. But, you know, Henry Ford had an idea with that that assembly line and that changed everything. It did. It really did. Well, that's cool. That's cool. So I knew I knew I liked you, Chevy guy. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> yeah, I love some Chevys. I love some Chevys. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I've been a, I've been a GM guy forever. Um, even though I I do I do I do think lately it's there there's some differences in the pickup lines, but yeah, I'm uh, I've got there's a couple that I'm actually really fond of, and the, and it's one of them's a, a '59 Impala, um, because I really like oh, yeah. them the big wing off the back, whatever reason they look kind of weird, but I just, you put one of those in black and there's only three, three colors for cars in my mind, red, black, gray. Don't care about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old school when it comes the to that. Impala, they're quite, they're quite unique. That's a, a different body style for the Impala. It's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Really yeah, hard yeah. To parts for really hard to parts for. Yeah. Oh yeah. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. I do like a 70 Cuda now because 70 Cudas, they look a lot like a 69 Camaro to me, but uh, yeah. a 70 Cuda. I said, if I had to go Dodge, I'd go a 70 Cuda for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, those uh, Dodge Daytonas, you get those up about as fast as they can go and they feel like they're going to fly and you're close to death anyway. So it's, <laughs> right. it's that's you right. know, they aren't made to go that fast, but they are, they were a fun <laughs> car. That's for sure. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I could talk about cars for a while. That's, that's, that's Absolutely. neat. That, that you had you had that stuff i mean that's that you know there's there's some people that are our age and 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 some of the younger people now too you see that really been able to turn it into a nice business and lifestyle and that's that's cool so you went you you were doing the car stuff then you had you had a um tell me about your music business that was pretty interesting yeah i absolutely love it i mean that's my heart and passion is music i've been a singer and songwriter for years so um i had an opportunity um, I've been a pastor for all this time and, you know, in between all this stuff. So it's yeah, kind of yeah. my vocational stuff. And, um, a friend of mine had a, had a little, little tiny store. He was trying to, to do a music store and he had a flower store and he's doing all these other things at one time. And he came to our church and started playing music with me on the, on the team. And, um, eventually told me he had this music store and he's going to go ahead and probably just dump everything and put it on eBay or something and put it in his garage. And I said, wait, what do you mean? You got what? And he said, music. I said, man. So I talked to him about it, went down and looked at everything. And I, I was like, Oh no, I mean, I'm the entrepreneur. Right. So I walked in that store and I'm like, I see the Taj Mahal of music stores in this little, oh, yeah. you know, 1000 1, square foot space. Right. So I, I saw it. I said, Oh, I got to have this. So, um, he made me, he made me a deal I couldn't refuse. Right. Yeah. So I had to go home and tell my wife, I, well, I had to ask for forgiveness. Really. I was like, well, I bought a music store. <laughs> so, so it was, it was a great opportunity and um, it took me a little bit of time, but about 10 years I had that business. Yeah. And the only reason I had to really stop, I mean, of course I went through 2008 with that music store and still survived. Yeah. Um, but by the time I got around to 2015, 
you know, I'd first gotten cancer. We talked about that a little bit in, in 2011, but then I came back stage four 2015. And I knew it was going to be a pretty, pretty hard fight. So between the economy and, and wow. the cancer, I had to let the music store go, which was, yeah. was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in, in my life. I, it took me months to finally say a yes to do it. I, I kept saying I was going to do it. And then finally I said I was going to do it. And it, it was just, it was horrible. Not to mention the way I went out, whole nother story with hiring a company that I would never, never do again to put me out of business. They put me out of business. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It was quite an experience. That he said, that's it. It's too bad to wait, but it had to be an interesting ride while you're in it. You know, that's, it was that's so fun. Thing. The best part for me was, you know, obviously I wanted to to have a business that made money, but I was more, I was more having, I was more interested in people and meeting the needs of the people. I mean, you know, one of the neat things, Damon, is having, having some little kid come to the music store for their first time, grabbing their first guitar, their first, hitting their first <laughs> drum, doing their first thing coming to their first lesson and you see those eyes get so wide oh, yeah. you're thinking i'm the guy that they're never gonna remember but i'm the guy that sold this kid his first whatever or her first whatever and yeah. they're gonna be playing the rest of their lives i got to be a part of that i mean how yeah. amazing is that right yeah yeah that no doubt had to be had to be quite a thrill it'd be quite a love thrill it, love it. And of course yeah. you got some old timers that want to come back and say boy when i was when I was in my days, I, I used to play guitar back in the day. And now, you know, they come back, get their guitar again, start all over. The whole, it's amazing how music can just do so much for life. And um, there's so many ways to express yourself and, and enjoy it. You don't have to be a rock star to, to have fun with music, right? That's the best thing about it. It's, it's supposed to make you have fun. Yeah. I always yeah. tell people, I say, buy a ukulele. Buy a ukulele. Nobody can ever see somebody play a ukulele and not smile. <laughs> it's like you see a little thing. That's things what you do. I can't play it's nothing anymore. I grab your ukulele, Damon. All you need to do is move your finger around a couple of places. You write a song. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down because that um it's a this year. Your first, here's the title for your new song, Tiptoe Through the Tulips. That'll be your first song. Yeah, <laughs> yep. That's the that's the one everyone knows. I've ever seen a ukulele been played. That's for sure. That's right. I've got I've got musical kids. My wife's are, my wife is musical, but I have no musical ability whatsoever. So I can appreciate, but I can't participate. So that's that's my deal. <laughs> um, I think you can do is play the radio. That's about it, huh? Yeah, that's good at that. I'm good at that. Yeah. Uh, that's so awesome. but anyway, that's awesome because I mean, it, you know, like you said, you're you're that that is really you follow the passion in both your automotive business and then your music business, and you're really able to do it. And I'm sure. Being a pastor too during that time, the musical influence was was kind of cool as well to be able to to um, do that while you're while you're doing the pastor. Um, oh, I'll know. tell you, there's so many people that come to church as a result of the store. It was a gateway to the door to church. Folks would find out, well, they like me, they like what I was doing, and they'd start coming to church, and we'd be having a good time. So I mean, it's just a great opportunity for connections and people. That's for sure. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. I mean, how does one decide to be a pastor? How does one what, decide to what, be a pastor? What do, what I, was the deal that you said I need to I need to go out there and do that? Yeah, I think um, you know that's an interesting question because not everybody that's a Christian is called to be a pastor. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's no surprise that I like to I like to run my mouth. Um, I'm always passionate about something. So when I gave my life to Christ, you know, I'm I'm the guy who was who was standing on the street corners telling people about Jesus. Like that was yeah. Matt Crow for real. Like I would go to yeah. street corners, I had tracks, I'd be going there telling everybody, right? Um, so there was just no way to stop me from from engaging with people. It was just the right way for me to go. And uh, you know, it was uh, I was blessed to have a lot of people in my life that helped to pour into me, helped yeah. to mentor me, disciple me in that aspect. Um, I decided, you know, one of the things while I was in the military, um, when I got out of the military, I was planning on coming back in as a chaplain. So when I got out, I got out to get my, my MDiv in, in theology and biblical counseling, which I did. And then I, uh, I never ended up going back into the army. As a result, I stayed, stayed here in a military town and, um, you know, I've been a civilian pastor the whole time, but, um, you know, it's just been one of those things that I felt like. You know, I was called to do. Never did I think that was going to be what I would do when I was younger. I wasn't, yeah. you know, I, I was nowhere Christian. So, you know, 
being a pastor was nowhere on my list. And, yeah. uh, you know, I figured well, most pastors are, are millionaires, so I might as well be a pastor and have a big, fat, cushy life and just sit back and do nothing, be on vacation all the time. Right. <laughs> so it's been it's been a great joy. Obviously, it's been a, a it's been able to there's, there's work involved. You know, a lot of people think pastors, maybe all you do is read the Bible and pray or something like that. But imagine having everybody's problems be now your problem. Imagine yeah. everybody dumping on you and expecting you to give them some kind of counsel or answers that that makes sense. And then at the same time, I don't have any problems myself, right? I have yeah, no problems exactly. whatsoever. Exactly. So, um, it's like a, wasn't that it, movie it, like Bruce? Just, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's, no. That's all right. Bruce Almighty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like Bruce right. Almighty. I, 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 when you were saying that, I was flashing back to me that time when he the emails started coming up and he's like, oh, it's not so bad. And they go, Brrr, you know, and it's like. <laughs> it's so true. It feels like that so much. I mean, it's just there's no off button. There's supposed to be. But it's very hard to be able to understand how to implement that that discipline, which is really a lot of things that's helped me in my business life as well to know how to do certain things. I think that that answering that call has helped me to to learn some balance. Not always uh, some age and some cancer disease has helped me with some of that stuff. And then uh, some some wiser people in my life have helped me. But, um, yeah, it takes takes a little while to learn some of those ropes. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about your battle with cancer. I mean, I, I, I you, you've had some good news recently. But let's talk about coming up to the good news. You know, you, you've been yeah. through it a couple of times. You've had a few things and, and, you know, it's, it, it, to put it mildly. And I'm like a grain of sand compared to the Sahara mildly. Uh, you, you've had some challenges there. I've had a couple of problems. Yeah, a couple of problems. Um, well, just like I said, originally going back to about 2011 is when I was first diagnosed with cancer and actually came as a result of me having a hernia. I had a hernia, had to have surgery and the hernia got botched up. So I was referred to Duke to have another surgery because it was really bad. So they needed to fix it really good. Yeah. So when I got there for my, uh, for my consult for the whole thing my wife was always on on me about these spots that were on my back and and i never paid attention to it because i don't really stare at my back that often i don't know yep. about you but um and then you know i'm a pig-headed husband and just kind of blow stuff off and whatever ah whatever i'll go to the doctor later so we get there and uh this doc was examining me. my wife said we just please look at him and she said oh yeah we uh we can't do anything till that's taken care of and within a week I was told, yeah, you've got cancer and we got to go in for surgery right away. So all this stuff started, went down really fast for me. Um, so that was a one year process of surgeries and, and healing. And then, um, then I had to come back for, for my hernia surgery on top of that too. So yep. I had a couple of surgeries all at what period of time. And um, the one thing hindsight I can look back at now during that period of time, 2011, is that um, they didn't really know much about the type of cancer that I had back then. Uh, it was pretty pretty uh pretty new still it was melanoma but um it was it was metastasizing it had metastasized fully it had gone in my lymph nodes yeah um but they didn't really do, do a lot of work on me at that period of time which didn't make a lot of sense then now it, yeah. now i understand some of that I could have done differently so i was given kind of an all clear and uh, of course we were praying and believing god for my healing all that stuff yeah. so then when they said You're good to go we felt like of course we are i am i mean that's god and here we go right and then uh, 2015, I was uh, getting ready to go on stage and, and sing. And right before I was getting ready to sing, I started coughing up a little bit. And, and I felt, you know, tightness in my chest, a little burning sensation. I felt like maybe I had a cold come on or something like that. And I started coughing up blood. Mm. I never coughed up blood in my life before. So I thought, okay, this is not cool. It's maybe I got pneumonia or something. Or I was thinking tuberculosis, something, all kinds of things, right? So uh, within a matter of a couple of days, because I didn't go right away because I'm still the stubborn idiot that I am. Yeah. Uh, go within a couple of days, see my buddy who's a PA and he checked it out and he says, hey, man, I've looked at this and uh, I think you've got some some bad pneumonia. We're going to put you on this. Actually, it wasn't my friend. It was a, a, another associate there. Put me on a Z-Pack and said, come back in seven days. So we did that. 
nothing changed in seven days. Still coughing yep. up blood, still problems. Go back. That's when I saw my buddy and he said, man, I'm looking at your x-rays right now, bro. You need to go back to Duke. And I said, for pneumonia? He said, no, man, I think your cancer's back. I said, what? Hmm. He was 100% right. I had had lung cancer at that point. But that's the interesting part. That wasn't where it started. I was already stage four. I started. I had it into my adrenal gland, by my kidney wall area, my muscle wall, by my leg. Then it had traveled to my lung. So I'd already had three or four different tumors. So I was immediately put on treatments, uh, trials, radiations, all kinds of stuff I had gone through. Um, that's really when a lot of stuff started happening with me, with the store. Um, and within that period of time is when I made the decision to shut the store down, 2015. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then within two months of shutting the store down, is when I was medevaced to the hospital with a bleeding brain tumor, and yeah. I had to have a brain surgery. Yeah, and did not shut the store down. I would have had been medevaced to the hospital, had emergency brain surgery. It took me almost three months to get over that brain surgery. Like three months laid up at the house. Yeah, I don't know how a business having a hard time without its owner could have done. Who, who this business relied on me way too much. Yeah, um, yeah. I would have been in a lot worse condition with my store in my life than had I, just, you know, I had the chance to to shut the store down at my own, my own desire, my my way, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Anyway. It was a tough time, but I mean, God has a way of working things out, and yeah, I had the time and the space to heal. I didn't have to, the pressure of of worrying about the store, employee stock, everything else, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, it was a, it was a wild time, that's for sure. Yeah, and I've still had you know ups and downs. Then, uh, just had another brain surgery three months ago from some yep. recurring stuff that happened in my brain again. But the good news, as we were saying here, all that bad news to say. The good news is right now, uh, the last test says that the cancer is all gone from my brain. My PET scan shows clear in my body that things are looking pretty good right now. So um, that's pretty good news. I am a cancer patient for life because the type yep. of cancer I have is pretty volatile, so it could flare up at any time. But, you know, my faith has been believing that God's going to heal my body completely. And I think that we're uh, we're finally seeing seeing that catch up here. It's taken a little while, but you know, we're finally getting to that space where I think we're, we're about to, to catch a break here a little bit. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, when you when you listen to people and you hear their stories like yours, mindset makes a difference mindset faith and what you're what you're doing makes a huge difference because you can't you can't tell me and people may debate this all till the end of time but do you think if you didn't have the deep faith that you had and you would be here today i know i'd be dead yep yeah even just even if i was just negative about it yeah, that's what I mean. You know, there, you, there's not whatever time you want to talk about there. Yeah. And I can't tell you that there weren't times that I that I was negative. There's times I wanted to give up and throw in the towel. There's several times I wanted to. Oh, do definitely. That. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but, I'm sure. Overall, yeah, I mean, it's just a tough, tough experience. You know, I'm still going through problems right now that I have yep. a lot of physical ailment problems. My quality of life is horrible, you know, but, um, you know, there's times that you have to, there's way more positive in that than negative. That, yeah. You know, the negative mindset to give up. I want to die. I want to throw in the towel. I could care less about surviving anymore. You know, I had way less of those thoughts than I had. I've got to make this. I've got to survive. You know, I've got a family. I've got children. I've got people in the world that care about me and need me. There's things I've got to call in my life. I've got things I need to do. You know, those types of things will be what motivate me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the chance for me to share with people my faith, my hope, my healing, my my drive, my excitement, my desires right um yeah you know it's it's like you know, back to my drug days it's like crack for yeah. my soul that i've got to really do that because it gives me gives me, well wants me living in my my purpose but yeah to help other people do that is is amazing so it, it would suck to be dead and not be able to do that you well, know? And that's, i think i still got years yeah i mean i think i think that's the, the one thing that i see from your story and i i get from your story and i hope I hope anyone listening or anyone that meets you does is and really gets to understand it is that you're here for a big you know you got things to do and that's been that's not it's why you're here today it's why we're talking yeah. today there's there's things that you have to do and and you have a story to tell and you have people to help and i think that's 
you know, anytime we've talked, I get that feeling. I understand that's why you're here. And when, you know, when we heard about your, your little bit of challenge you had here recently, it was, it was, it, you know, you, it was not easy again, but you know, you're with us here today. And I think that's, there's a reason for that. And yeah, now when I, there's when no I get, what's that? Yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah. My hearing is horrible. That's why I have to ask once in a while. It's like, ah, at least it's on my good ear that my speaker is at. So I need to use headphones, but you know, yeah, that's for the military too. But anyway, the, uh, um, uh, but no, I think that's, that's, it's a, a testament to that, that there is, there is a calling and you found your passion and, and, you know, it's, it, it's through your life. You've the different passions may have changed a little bit, but it's all around. When you think of the theme behind this, it's helping people, right? It's helping people right. as, yeah. as, as a, as a, uh, helping people enjoy their their hobby in a car, enjoying music in your music store, and and finding finding their faith as a pastor. And now we turn into the to the part of the, uh, part of your life and career that I think is is exciting for me, and I, I hope that people listening is exciting for them too. Is as you help people on their journey as a life coach or an executive life coach, and and uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that and what you're doing there now. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's the same same ingredients, just a little different flavor, right? I have a different chance to to be able to provide things into people's lives that, you know, from my experience, you know, I've I've lived I've lived a, a long life already, and I've had a great lot of great opportunities which have uh, helped me to learn many different things. Uh, I have a long way to go still, but I have a lot of life experiences. I tell people this: I sure know what not to do. And I could really help you out. Now, don't go down that way for sure. I mean, I can, yeah. I got books on that one. So uh, consequently, that's obviously learning how to do some things the right way. I would hope that I, I have the ability to share that with some folks, you know. So from my drugs and alcohol to my military times, from leadership stuff, from uh, building churches, from, uh, you know, building businesses, from yeah. having hundreds of people under my employment for those period of times. I mean, um, my design, my graphics, my creativity, all these things I like to do. There's so many things there that I'm like, how, how is it that I cannot give some of this stuff to people? I yeah. don't feel like I'm supposed to take this to the grave. I, I need to get rid of this stuff while I'm here. So the greatest opportunity I have is to be able to share that with people in their businesses or their personal lives and, and uh, help them to, to learn some things maybe in a much better way than, than I did. And I've uh, been able to develop some tools and, and some opportunities for people to learn things different ways, you know, uh, yeah. through that process. That's what's fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Ira, Ira Bowman said something, he said, hindsight is 2020. And I think that's it for, for people that lived a little bit of life, that's, that just, that hits home a lot. We've had to learn a yeah, lot of things right. and, and uh, he's yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's, I can uh, only imagine what I'll be thinking 20 more years from now. Yeah, wow, exactly. I was stupid at 50. <laughs> what I was thinking. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, it's, it's, uh, for a lot of people, and I don't know if it is for you, uh, aging is fun for me. I really enjoy, um, I, I've enjoyed every stage of my life and I don't know if it's been like it for you, you know, the, the younger, wilder, crazier that had a ball, but as I've gotten older, I really enjoy the, the serenity it brings. I guess if anything else, yeah, you still get you still yeah, get the there's no doubt. Sessions, but it but once you just get that, there's just a different feeling that you get. I think that's that's pretty fun, and and to be able to help people, like you said, getting it, older, thinking about getting older, I used to I used to get mad at my grandmother. We would go out to eat, and she'd always order coffee with her dinner, right? But but she would complain if the coffee was cold or it was this or right? And I always get so mad, like just drink the coffee, right? Now, now I'm getting the age where I'm thinking, wait a minute, I, I asked for this coffee that I'm paying good money for and I want good coffee. If it's cold coffee, I don't go. <laughs> now I'm the guy saying, send this back and bring me some new coffee, would you? I can't yeah. believe it happened. <laughs> Did you do the same thing? Come on now. <laughs> if I pay good money for it, I want what I paid for. Oh, oh yeah. man. I my grandma. <laughs> yeah, that's a hilarious one there. That's a hilarious one. That is for sure. But there's there's something about value, right? And we learn a thing 
I think it's important to understand value and then to appreciate value as well. You know, yeah. it doesn't come easy. And, you know, for folks our age, our grandparents that served during the, the World War II era yeah, and uh, the, the type of people that were back then, man, the men and women of that era, really the backbone of, of our country. Mm -hmm. And the thing they're able to do, you think about these guys at World War II that were 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Dying and or coming home and starting families in these little 800 square foot houses and living there yeah. for 30 years or whatever. And they they appreciated and valued everything they had. They had yeah. a church suit. They had yeah. a some a pair of pants for work. They had a few shirts they had. Right. But oh, my Lord, look at us today. So, yeah. you know, I think there's something to say about value. That's one thing that I I think that that's one reason why I get angry sometimes that I think the word value gets played out so much on social media and places like our lovely LinkedIn. Yeah. People talk about value, value, value. And I'm thinking, do you really know what value means? Yeah. Let's, let's talk value, right? So I, I've learned to appreciate value. And and I, I want to, if I say that I want to provide you a value, then I want to make sure myself, before you even get that value, that, that that's real value. Yeah. I mean, why would I offer you something that's junk, right? So- uh, but yet not everybody thinks that way these days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is, you, you bring up a, a subject with me that I think about a lot as, as I was fortunate enough to be around my grandparents, as you said too. And I think that, you know, living in my growing up in the Midwest on a farm, uh, my grandparents obviously were, were farmers and I can remember thinking, why does my grandmother have 40 wonder bag old bread bags in the drawer and all the little plastic you know whatever you thing over the end of the twist bread bag to close the and the twist ties and everything like that you know the just the thrift and and trying to use everything to the maximum is really really was incredible that 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 generation shows but and and when i think about that and i look at anything and one of the things that that it brings me back to right now is a lot of people get down about stuff and when you look around they can be down about their life and almost everything's horrible and they're sitting in a room watching a nice television they're they're you know at least not a semi full belly they're inside of a structure you know lots of good around them every day and when they start if they don't start with understanding that you're always going to be wanting and if you're always wanting you're never going to be satisfied and and I understand you should be hungry to be to be better and all those kind of things, but we also have to be. I I believe is, is we have to be more. You have to be more content. satisfied. It's contentment, I think, to learn to be content with what we have. Because um, I mean, we can be satisfied. I mean, that's a big big word, but I think contentment. Yeah, is a place where you've understood where you understand value. I I say it to my kids sometimes. My kids that have grown up in a digital world, they don't know anything about that kind of. They don't know anything without a cell phone or with an internet connection. They mm -hmm. never have. They don't. It's it's completely foreign to them to think of it differently than that. Yeah. Um, so contentment is a. It means something different to them. So you know with people of the of the era I'm talking about like with our grandparents that are all you know most of our grandparents are, are gone now but God, yeah. you know um how many more stories are we going to get from those people how many more uh, emotional things we have from them how many examples do we have from them if they're gone so it's up to another generation that's closer to that generation that's gone to hopefully interject some of that into our culture or guess what yeah. Yeah. Imagine, imagine the teenagers of today being the next presidents and, and leaders yeah. and without, yep. oh my. Yeah. yeah. So it, it requires some, some loving direction. <laughs> yes. Well, Kelly Robinson mentioned gratitude and daily practice of gratitude. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that, you know, if, if we can do, do that, it, uh, it, it definitely helps because the, I the think it's important to do it without it becoming so, so, um, so habitual that it doesn't mean anything anymore. A lot of people can say gratitude and all that kind of stuff, which is fantastic. And I, I know Kelly, I, I know she means well, but my, my point is, is that it's really easy to, to say that, but it becomes a check the box kind of a thing. 
well, I got to make sure I say these things, do these things today. Thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for that. Or, or maybe some people even say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for that. I appreciate this. I appreciate that. You've checked the box. You go on with your day. Um, that's not real gratitude. Yeah. It's yeah. important to really understand how to hold on to those things. And that's, that's where you talked about with the wonder bags, the twisty ties, right? Yeah. Wasn't that, wasn't that your grandma was cheap? It's that they they had they understood value. Yeah. Maybe they were, maybe they're a little cheap sometimes. Yeah. But on the other, but it, you know, it came from came from from good understanding of what what they could lose. You know. Yeah. And yeah. It's hard for people to do that. And today. Today's today. Oh, here I go again. Those young people today. Those young <laughs> folks today. They don't, they don't. I'm saying it right now. I just caught myself. God. Yeah. Bless. But it's true. There's a there's a difference. There is a big difference. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so important for us as leaders and entrepreneurs, uh, mentors to be able to fully explain, explain and express, you know, the why behind the things that we do. And and although we may be crazy old people, you know, why why are we living out the things we are? What what makes it important, you know, and to be able to share that with people in yeah. a in a compelling, loving um powerful way is is very important yeah yeah that's for sure that's for sure so you're 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 doing life coaching now is part of what you do so right e explain that a little bit and kind of kind of you know how you're helping people that way you know you live in a life of abundance i believe is what what uh, we were talking about yeah so my, my 25 my 25 cent statement is this that i i help people overcome life obstacles so they can achieve the number one goal and live a life of abundance. Yeah. And what has brought me to that point? And you know, it's just a quick sentence really, but it took me a long time to come up with that sentence because I, I really wrestled with it a long time. Um, but everything that I've been through in my life, it comes down to me being able to overcome life obstacles. It yeah. comes down to me able to really achieve my number one goal. It really comes down to my understanding of abundance and, and, and abundance. Maybe when I was, you know, 25 years old, I thought abundance was like I could be a millionaire one day. Um, but now abundance means to me that we can live life debt free, that we're content, that we're happy, that um, it's not bad to have nice things. But, you know, we don't have to have an abundance and excess of things. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's things I've learned. So for me, abundance means a whole lot more. So I like to teach people about a few things. One, I, if you can't overcome life obstacles and forget everything else, there is no life purpose. There is no number one yeah. goal. Just in this nonstop roller coaster of crap. Yep. And, you know, we're all going to experience it. But if you have the right tools to be able to get through that crap, then it's easier to get to the other places. And what you may think your number one goal is, it may may not have necessarily been a goal after all. It might have been just a, you know, a pipe dream or might have been something that was actually part of something bigger and you realize wow i'm i don't believe in myself enough to think that i actually can achieve that goal so instead i'll i'll settle for this one yeah when in all actuality you may be able to shoot for the stars right yes. but if you don't believe in yourself you don't you don't have faith in who you are you don't have something grounded bigger than yourself do something bigger than yourself if you don't think that you have the skills talents and ability to do something well you're going to get what you believe for mm. nothing <laughs> so you have a choice right so it's important to learn those things. I think overcoming obstacles, achieving that number one goal and experiencing a life of abundance for me, that's, I think where it's all at. And that's why I love to be able to pour into people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. And you are, that is a hundred percent. It's so true that people look at these goals, like, you know, I want to do this, but I, I don't, don't think I can. So I, I, I I'm going to try to shoot for here. And so, yeah. so it's and like, almost, it, they, they don't even say it that way. They just, they believe it on the inside. They don't say yeah. it out loud and they'd yeah. be too embarrassed to tell you or me, but they go there and it's like, yeah. oh, you can do better. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's an interesting thing. And uh, well, being through it myself, I mean, I, there, there's a lot of times when you look at it and you go, I just don't know if you can. And, and uh, you know, it, it takes some help once in a while. It takes some so it help. It does. And in a business like yours with Exit Your Way, you know, it, it goes one of two ways. One is the Exit Your Way and you can sell this thing and make some good money, retire and, and go to Hawaii. Or, you know, you're going to have to finally get rid of this dream you had 
to have this great business and and shut it down and yeah. at least you can at least you can go home with some toys and maybe pay a few bills instead of owing everybody and their brother and having a miserable life right so yeah. you know it goes a couple of ways so during that period of time you get to do a lot of coaching yourself it's a lot of uh, helping people get through some some horrendous times i had to had to lean on somebody to help me to go out of business yeah i i uh i knew what to do but you know, there's just things that I, I had a hard time letting go of because it was my baby. It was my things. Right. And it's like, yeah. it's like when you're, uh, you know, I was in the military and I have to jump off things, did air assault, all that kind of stuff. So when I first did repelling, I was in this big, tall tower and I was on the edge of the tower. I was getting ready to go off my first time. And it's all, it's all man stuff. At that point you're like, everybody's all, you know, teasing yeah. me. Everybody's all. So I'm there for the first time and I'm sitting on the edge of this thing. And I'm looking down. It looked like it might as well have been the Empire State Building. Yeah. But we were maybe 30 feet up. I mean, that's tall, but it wasn't massive, right? So I'm hanging over the edge of this thing. And I looked at the guy in front of me and I said, hey, dude, you're going to have to kick me off of this right now. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, just put your foot in my chest. And he said, okay. And he pushed me. And when he did, I mean, as soon as I was off the edge of that thing, it was the best moment of my life it felt so good but just getting off the edge just leaving that place to take that leap was the hardest thing in my life to do and yeah. sometimes somebody just giving us a kick in the butt to get off that, that thing and and then you realize wait a minute this is kind of cool out here i want to do that again <laughs> yeah yeah that's 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 a great that's a great story and, and and a life story first for you but it's a great it's a great uh, thing for people to think about because often we the only thing that stops us in in i don't know how many percent much of the time but a vast majority of time is our mind yeah it's the only thing that stops us because when you look at all the things that we can't do or we think we can't do and you really take them back into oh i can't do that i can't do this it, it's it's you've built up walls in your mind and and people like you can help you know, tear those walls down and show people that a step at a time and you can get there. And that's Absolutely. the cool thing about, about the life coaching and, and the things that you help people with. Well, that's what I love about it. And, uh, you know, I've been through enough other coaches uh, in my days of trying to, uh, you know, coming from a pastoral background. I mean, I've been coaching for years, but to really go into a life coach business world where I'm in, you know, now, I wanted to get some different type of training than I'd had in the past and want to learn some different things. And um, I can't tell you how many times I was disappointed by, by coaches and companies out there that were just there strictly to rip me off. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't care about me. They cared about being in the double comma club. They cared about, you know, telling us about their yachts and their toys and their this and that and the other. They didn't give a crap about me. Yeah. And, um, I was I was highly disappointed in some people and I I never want anybody that I have in my life have to go through something like that yeah. ever. It's yeah. just ridiculous. And they get charged these astronomical fees. I paid some stupid money, I'm telling you what. Yeah. And they people get paid this money. And I'm thinking, how could you sleep? Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, you no wonder you don't give your address out. Because people will come and kill you. <laughs> yeah. mean, there's just some crazy people out there. So anyway, I like to provide value to people that uh, that are part of what I do. That's for sure. Well, they get all have, of me. I don't feel like, you know, what comes out. And you have a history. Yeah, I say they get all of me. So Yeah. Yeah. They get all of you. And you have a history of helping people, though. I mean, that's that's the thing that that I think really makes unique unique among, among people and yeah there's other people that help people and other things like that but when you look at your history and helping people follow their passion and being a pastor and the years that you've done this and then your own struggles through through the difficulties that you've had medically uh, uh it just where you're at today is where i believe you're meant to be and i think that that, that your life it all of our lives really it it adds up to be where we're at today good and bad and it's all it and it all yeah. turns, it, it turns us into where we eventually in our minds want to get if we if we keep moving forward and i think you're you as being an, a, a life coach now you've had life experience of many lifetimes 
in your life. And I think, the, right. you know, the, the business, the business, the, the, just the life experience and everything else, it, it, it gives you a credibility and an experience level that you can share with others that many uh, are, are not even going to hold a candle to. So it's well, cool. it's a blessing. Man. It's a, it's a price you pay, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, and like he, like he said a minute ago that, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020. I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have said it was grateful back then, you know, yeah, but, yeah. uh, I wouldn't even yeah. say I was grateful last week for some things, but yeah. you know, you learn, you learn some things and there's, yeah. there's great, great lessons in life. If we're willing to, if we're willing to listen and uh, I'm nowhere near I tell people this all the time. We, we say this at our church is that, you know, for, me as a follower of Christ. I am a follower of Christ. I am not a perfect example. I'm just a living one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's all I can sure. say today about all that stuff, you know, and that's why I love even with my business consulting stuff to me, life coaching, business consulting, it's all the same to me. It's like I can either do a one-on-one -on -one thing or it's a group thing. It might be at a business. It might be somewhere else, but to me, it's all the same. It's like, we're all people and we have to learn how to, how to work with each other. Right. So, yeah. And I've been able to learn a lot of things that, uh, that I think are, are pretty awesome to be able to share with folks. And, you know, I'm passionate about servant leadership. So then when it comes down to businesses, you know, if you're not, if you don't have a good structure of leadership and servant leadership, yep. if you got some, some tyrant jerk at the top, then, you know, forget it. No wonder your numbers suck. No wonder people are miserable yeah. at work or quitting. Or, you know, I mean, there's you know, there's reasons for everything. Yeah. Well, and, and if you're helping the leaders get get their their life straight or their purpose in life straight or whatever you're helping them with, then they can begin to do that with other people. And sure, and, some leaders don't realize that. <laughs> they, th you know, they think, what do you mean nobody else thinks the way I think? Yeah. I mean, they don't know what I do. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you you don't have it right, Bob. <laughs> I mean, let's back up here. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a reason why everybody here hates you. <laughs> let's go. I've got a list, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got it from everyone. They handed it to me on the way in. Yeah, I got that in the first five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but I think that's that's uh um it is it is because you can get them get them in the right place so that they can begin to lead others in the right place. And that's, that's, that's so important. Um, you just won't get there. And, and in business today, it's so critical to have everyone's mind in it, because if you don't, the, you, you're just going to miss out because that's where the real gold is at. The gold in business is not to, have people reporting to work on time is to have their minds coming with them to work when they get there. Right. Our and, uh, and friend we, of mine, KJ Wong, he would say to be present, right? Yes. So it, it's very true. It's important to be present. And uh, although being on time is important. Um, yes. But at the same time, if you're a person who gets the job done, then there's there's grace when stuff like that happens once in a while, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, come on, be on time once in a while. But man, you sure did hit a home run this week, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's ways to do things and still be successful, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a big difference between, I, I don't think I know, there's a big difference between perfectionism and excellence. Yes. And I come from a background personally of perfectionism. I'm a recovering perfectionist. I guess that's a word. And, uh, and I've been learning excellence on uh, the past, you know, 10 years or so of my life. Um, and I, I've arrived in some areas and I'm way, way off in the distance of arriving at some others. But, you know, it's it's not healthy to be a perfectionist. It's not help. There's no such thing as perfection, uh, not in business, not in the world we're living in right now. But there is an opportunity for excellence. Yes. And excellence is, saying, hey, look, I can make a mistake, but if I do the best I did and the be best I can give it all I've got, then that's great. Yeah. You, know, you just keep on for the stars, but you know, perfectionism cuts you off at the knees. You don't give you a chance to do anything. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a fallacy. Perfection is, is a fallacy. I mean, it really is. And, and that when you talk to the best people or, or really, really good people in their field and whatever they've done, every one of them has failed 10 times more than the, or, or hundreds or thousands of times more than the average person because they've been willing to fail and keep going. And um, right. 
my Jeffrey Graham used to always say it like this, or does still say it. I mean, shouldn't say it in that word, that way. But he says, you know, I, I had to suck a lot to get this good. And, yeah. and it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Um, yeah. And, and when, when you can instill that in, into a leader that they're, they're trying to shoot for excellence and they can do that with their, with their organization or even in themselves, they understand it's a process. It's a process we have to try so that we may fail, but we're going to give it our best effort. We're going to give it with the, with the knowledge we have and we're going to move forward. If we fail, we're going to learn and we're going to get up and we're going to go again. And, and that's, that's the way that the best get better. And, and, and in business, I mean, the, the competitive nature of business today doesn't allow for people not to not to be thinking this way in their business and stay in business long term. That's my philosophy. Oh, right. oh you're so, right. Yeah. And the Lord knows in today's business world. I mean, you can't I mean, you can't sneeze and get in trouble these days. You know, it's just so many things that are people are looking to to find. Oh, there's a lot of fault finding. And yes. I think it uh, is actually you know, valid in some areas, but then the, it gets to the point where you get so used to fault finding that you go off the deep end and now there's no one that can do any good. Um, yeah. So then you just go back in this whole perfectionism thing, even though you think you stand for excellence, but then you're really a perfectionist because you got all your, it's, it's just crazy cycle yeah. that uh, you have to know how to get out of. There has to be a balance. There has to be a standard. There has to be something there. Right. And I think it's important for any business, any person to have, have, uh, you know, some kind of a foundation, some kind of a goal, some type of a standard in your life. Uh, the whole statement is you, you have to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Important. yeah. And, and, you know, and, and one last thing that I, that I uh, was going to just talk about briefly is, is, you know, it doesn't matter where you're starting from. I see people and I talk to them and they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm really not there where you, where you're at and where you're at is a starting point. It doesn't matter if you're here or you're here or there or there, you're at your starting point. It's different for all of us. Take right. the next step and that's all you really can do. You know, it doesn't make anybody any better than anybody else. It just means we're at different places, different places. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So, well, Matt, it's it's been awesome talking to you, getting to know you a little better. And I, I just every time we talk, I just enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, and I really love today being able to talk about your background and, and where you're at today. And, and it just just makes me feel good to see you here with us today and then and being able to follow your passion like you are. I so it beats, it beats the best hospital in town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you, you definitely know where that's at. And I, I keep that in my mind and hopefully I never have to know that. <laughs> I, hope either, brother. I hope you don't either. Yeah. The, um, if people want to get a hold of you, they can get a hold of you on LinkedIn, Matt Crump on LinkedIn and it's Matt Crump TV. Yeah, Matt TV. Crump. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, did I miss anything there? No, my other site from my, uh, my ministry and my book, which, uh, the book's called God's got this. And yes. uh, my website is God's got this dot love. And we could talk about it another time. It's this book right here. But I've just uh, been working with another fellow uh, recently. And uh, turns out we're going to be doing a second edition of my book and doing a new new release here very shortly. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's right. We were talking about that. And I, I missed that. I didn't. Oh, I got it on my notes, but I just I was talking to you and I, I missed it. Too. <laughs> yeah. So that's so, all right. Okay. I was I was gonna stop and then I almost Ira Bowman brought it up, said love the beard too. So tell us oh, yeah, about, that's because we're we about the story the beard and we haven't heard your decision. I haven't heard your decision yet. Yeah, so um I will make it really long story short. Basically, when I went stage four was when my pretty round round about the times that my mother in law actually died of cancer as well. Uh -huh. And I've always had a beard of some sort uh, from birth. No, I mean, I've always had some kind of facial hair since I've been an adult. And yeah. um, I decided that um, the, one of the first things that cancer typically does in anybody's life that goes through cancer treatments and radiation and chemos and treatment, all that kind of stuff, first thing goes is your hair. So I decided that I was going to grow my beard out, let it grow as much as it could because cancer wasn't going to take my my beard it wasn't going to take my life 
And whenever I'm 100% cancer free is the decision that I've made that I, I'll be the one to choose when this comes off. And it will be me that takes the hair off my face, not cancer. So, um, you know, the past past few months, I've been contemplating whether or not it's time for for the old follicles of freedom to become a bit more freer and uh, possibly cut back a little bit on my beard. I've had a hard time with that because I've oh, grown yeah. quite or it's quite attached to me, one of the others. <laughs> so yeah. uh, actually, what people don't know is I've actually, last week I cut six inches off the bottom of this beard. Can't even tell, it's still long. But I did cut six inches. I was I gave myself a trial run. I did it my, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. Oh my. So, uh, my, my thought, my stand in faith has always been to believe God for my healing. Isaiah 53, 3, 5 says that by his stripes were healed. And I, I believe God's my healer. He didn't give me cancer in the first place. So, I felt like once I was finally the position in place of saying that the cancer is gone and and of the last tests we've been having, um, things are looking a lot more positive. Um, so I felt like, is this the time for me to fully engage with my faith and say, let's go, let's cut her off and say I'm done with this cancer battle, right? Um, so I've been I've been playing around with that here lately yeah. and uh, I've been making some decisions on whether or not I'm going to do it. So I, you'll probably see stages because i'm always gonna have some kind of a beard i love yes. i love to have a beard yes yes uh, but it, it does get i i'm i'm tired of it being really long actually sometimes it just gets really in the way and my wife hates it with a passion so yeah you know if i ever want to kiss my wife again i might have to cut it off yeah that's kind of important it's kind of I important so. i think yeah. so for her i need her to feel feel you know cared for so i might need to take this off yeah so well i, I wanted I'm to get that you know, I might go, who knows? And we'll see what happens. You know, yeah. it's not for people have been four years, but for a lot of people on LinkedIn, they don't know anything else but the beard. So, yes. And there's, I put a video out about it that's a little, little more eloquent than what I just shared, but it's on LinkedIn about the story behind the beard and my YouTube channel, too. But yeah. 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 I think it's coming close to the time where, it, where I may be, may be cutting it back or off one of the two. Yeah. That's, I, I can imagine that's a, that's a hell of a decision for you. It is. It's tough. It's tough. I think I know it sounds dumb, but buddy, I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm having a hard time with thinking about parting with the beard. Yeah. And, you know, you know, as well as I do, it's one heck of a marketing tool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People recognize yeah. the beard. Yeah. Cut this yeah. thing off. I'm like, who's that guy? I have no yeah. idea. Fat old well, we'll have to wait and see what happens, Matt. You know, it's. Well, it's wait and see. Sense. Yep. You just you never, never know. know. I know it'll probably wait until the, I'm done with the second edition of the book because it still needs to have the beard and with all my stuff. But um, I may have already taken pictures and been done with that, though. We'll have to see. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Well, we'll be looking forward to your second edition coming out and, and the, the other stuff from you. You're, you're a frequent poster on LinkedIn with your videos and others. Those are very ins inspirational, and I know people love to see those. Um, and like for anyone listening, if you haven't connected with Matt Crump, get connected to him. Follow him uh, on on LinkedIn and and also check out his YouTube stuff. Does a great job there as well. Um, Matt, awesome seeing you. Thanks for stopping by and talking with us today. As usual, love it and uh, look forward to talking again in the future. Yeah, I'm so grateful for you, buddy. Thank you for letting me be on the show today. I appreciate it. You bet. You bet. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir.